Hello everyone and welcome back to The Dish. I'm Jamie Sanders. And I'm Mary Allendorf. And we are live in the studio to tell you all about popping that culture. You're darn tootin'. We have got some surprises for you. Whatever will we talk about? That's right, no one knows. What could we possibly drop on you guys tonight? Boy, oh boy, it's a real mystery. Actually, I am kind of confused about that one. Gotta keep the suspense alive, man. Come on. Let's get into it. Where Netflix leads, we will follow. TV Line reported today that Netflix is picking up episodes of the 2000 to 2007 beloved WB show Gilmore Girls. Supposedly, the original cast will be back, along with the showrunner Amy Sherman Palladino. Amy left the show before the seventh season, which accordingly was a pile of steaming garbage. Hopefully, the new Netflix content will give us less garbage and more of that good old Lorelai and Rory banter and bring our hearts back into Stars Hollow. However, though major news publications like this one have reported that there, this story, there is no confirmation from the cast, crew, or Netflix as of yet. Oi with the poodles already, let's hope this is for real. Now, we know, all know that I am hashtag number one Kardashian family fan, and while Kardashian news is usually us applauding Kim's change back from platinum blonde to brown or Chloe holding a medicine ball, today's news is a little more somber. Chloe's estranged husband, Lamar Odom, was found unconscious last week at a brothel from a drug overdose. Odom suffered kidney failure and slipped into a coma, which he came out of earlier this weekend and spoke to Chloe, who was, of course, at his bedside. Honestly, I think this is a better fairy tale than Cinderella. Boy meets girl, boy and girl get married, boy does drugs and cheats on girl, girl files for divorce but doesn't sign the papers, boy slips into a coma after ingesting too many drugs and having sex with like a lot of prostitutes, then wakes up and says hi to girl. What a beautiful children's story in the making. Jenny Farley, whom you only know as Wow from the Jersey Shore, just got hitched to her longtime boyfriend. Is she still relevant? No, she is not. Not even slightly, Mary. Seth Rogen and his wife Lauren threw James Franco a bar mitzvah on Saturday as part of the Rogen's annual Hilarity for Charity variety show to raise awareness for Alzheimer's. The actor slash teacher slash art student slash director slash writer slash producer slash self-taught god taught Yamaka all while Miley Cyrus performed in a blue thong, a shalom y'all embroidered cape, and, a, and while holding a huge plastic star of David. I guess the moral of the story is that James Franco is now an adult. Maybe. And it was probably way better than any bar mitzvah I've ever been to. Lindsay Lohan announced that she's going to run for president in 2020. Instead of the typical form of announcing your candidacy, aka the VMAs, Lilo took to Instagram, captioning a picture in hashtag 2020, I may run for president. Through ups and downs, hashtag yes we can, let's do this at Kanye West. I'm really conflicted about this announcement. Would I vote for Lilo? Probably. But which Lilo? Parent Trap Lilo? Absolutely. Herbie Fully Loaded Lilo, not so much. Mean Girls Lilo, 100%. Who wouldn't want Caddy, or, oh, Katie Heron in the White House? Maybe Regina George could be her VP, or Kanye. I mean, either one would do. We would definitely be able to solve our foreign policy problems now. But you know, it's not all mean girls here at The Dish. Uh, in fact, we actually have some nice boys. That is very true. In fact, our resident nice boy, Aaron Kenningsburg, is going to talk about this fair city in today's Kenningsburg Corner. Let's get him a bar mitzvah. Wow, a nice boy. Thanks, Mom and Dad, for that A-plus validation. Have you ever wondered what ghosts are roaming the streets of Boston and whether or not they pronounce their eyes correctly? Well, we can't guarantee an answer to that second part, but the Ghosts and Gravestones Fright Seeing Tour can help you out with the first. Tis the season to sign up for this After Dark Ghost Tour that will take you around the city and show you all the creepy stops in Boston. Get the lowdown on the Boston Strangler and maybe find out how his ghost is dealing with the transition from A-list status to quiet retirement. Hear stories behind all those random cemeteries shoved in between Dunkin' Donuts and skyscrapers that you've always wondered about. Uh, tickets are $36.75 for students, and the tour offers a 100% money-back guarantee in the rare case you don't find it spooky enough. However, they seem pretty confident that won't be a problem. If you like watching scary movies and hate normal sleeping hours, Coolidge Corner Theater has the perfect solution for you. This October 31st, the theater will be hosting their 15th annual 12-hour horror movie marathon. 
That's 12 full hours of back-to-back -back horror movies starting from midnight on Halloween all the way till noon the next day. So grab your adult diapers and protein bars because you're going to be there for a while. Uh, the two feature films of the night will be Halloween 2 followed by Trick or Treat. The rest of the time block will be filled with four additional movies that are traditionally kept a secret until opening night. If you come in a costume, you might win a prize, but it's Halloween, so if you're not dressed up as something, what are you even doing? Uh, tickets are on sale now. Another Boston-based movie is coming to theaters, so get ready to critique A-list actors on their ability to say, pack the car. The new movie, Spotlight, stars Mark Ruffalo, Rachel McAdams, and Michael Keaton. It tells the true story of the Boston Globe's uncovering of the Catholic Church sex scandal in Boston back in the early 2000s. The movie has been earning rave reviews since its premiere at the Toronto Film Festival, and the Boston Globe has been, been tweeting plenty of praise for the project, like a proud mom clogging up your newsfeed with her kids' accomplishments. Emerson College will be screening the movie in early November, so for all you journalism students who get off on really good investigative reporting, this could be right up your alley. Now, if anyone felt an odd shift in the air this past weekend, almost like a dark presence looming nearby, it's because Donald Trump had entered the state of Massachusetts. Donald held a, held a campaign rally in the small town of Tingsboro, Massachusetts this past Friday to a crowd of 1,000 supporters all packed into the local elementary school's gymnasium. Kind of reminds you of all those terrible school assemblies you had to sit through, but much, much worse. Uh, Trump talked about the big, beautiful wall he's going to put up on the Mexican border and brought members of the Tingsboro police on stage to shake their hands. Much like his hair clinging to the side of his scalp, Trump is clinging on to the hope that he will win the vote of a blue state like Massachusetts. <laughs> I guess only time will tell. Oh, time. I am so out of it. So I will throw it back to Jamie and Mary. Thank you, Aaron, for all the spooks. I am yeah. a proud dad. Aaron, you are just, he's just, he's just a good boy. Hey, he is. That bow tie. That bow tie. I I'm think. I'm so proud. He's, he's like, I, even though I'm clearly his father figure in this, right. in this like metaphor, like, I, I think I aspire to be like him someday. Wow. How does that work? I don't know. It's like back to the future. Whoa. Whoa. More Weird. about that later. Yeah. Ha. Well, that's ha. creepy. Ha. Is he the Marty McFly or is he the. The, uh, I've I've always dog. I've always filled the Doc Brown role in my in really? my relationships. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, your you know, hair needs to be a little bit can, more messed up. Oh, I would say. oh, it can get more messed up. Yeah, it that's can true. It can poop I don't know out if that's like that. the look we want for TV. It's but true. You know, I mean, you know, I, I may try it someday. I don't know. Yeah. We have a few more episodes left. Yeah. Uh, but you'll see. Anyway, uh, let's get some more spooky stuff going on here. Toss it over to Brandon from the Spooks. Thanks, you two. But I told you guys earlier that I can't guarantee a spook-free segment. Now you love paying for the great original content from Hulu and Netflix. Now get ready to pay for the latest videos of people falling down stairs. YouTube is expected to announce this week its long anticipated subscription service, YouTube Red. For $10 a month, people can watch current uploaded videos ad free. The site has also said that those who subscribe will get exclusive content only available to them. Now, this sounds like a good deal, but want to know an even better one? Donating, t donating $10 to Adblock because it's YouTube, not you pay. <laughs> I crack myself up. Now, Felix Shelberg, better known as, by his YouTube name PewDiePie, was recently announced as the highest paid YouTube star, receiving $12 million last year for his video game commentaries. So don't worry, friends. Your $10 a month are being well spent. Other YouTubers on the list include comedy duos Smosh and Red and Link, as well as dancing violinist Lindsey Sterling. So to all the kids out there who want to play video games for a living, now is your time to break in. Sure, you may have to start out by fetching PewDiePie's coffee while he shoots virtual people, but remember, that could be you one day. Speaking of playing video games for a living, PewDiePie may be the most popular Let's Player, but can't it get tiring watching one guy talk over a video game? If you feel this way, then how about trying two guys? Game Grumps is a YouTube channel consisting of comedians Aaron Hansen and Danny Avidan providing their own unique video game commentary. What sets this channel apart from other video game Let's Plays is the duo's easy chemistry and how they work off each other. Hansen usually gets more frustrated and angry while playing video games, while Avidan is more laid back regardless of the game's quality, resulting in a hilarious contrast. The channel is also expanded to include other shows, such as Steam Train, which primarily focuses on online games, and Table Flip, which focuses on board games. 
So if you're like me and have no friends to play video games with, but you want to pretend that you do, look no further than Game Grumps. Let's take a look at what's trending on Twitter. A popular hashtag that's been going around is four words to live by. People have started tweeting four words that they believe are the way to live a happy life. These have ranged from inspired phrases such as adopt a shelter pet and wax on, wax off to ones like we all die eventually. People also use the hashtag to express things they want from the future. For example, normal dining hall spoons. So what four words do I live by? Video of the week. It's Halloween time, so chances are you've carved a pumpkin. But have you ever carved a pumpkin with a gun? Yes, you heard that correctly. A man recently went viral this week for carving a pumpkin with a Henry rifle. He did this by simply shooting holes into the pumpkin in what was supposed to resemble a classic jack-o'-lantern face, but looked more like an alien that just got woken up. The man said in the description for the video that he wanted to demonstrate the safe way of carving pumpkins as opposed to using sharp knives. That's right, America. You've been carving pumpkins wrong all these years. If you truly want to be safe while carving pumpkins, it is vital that you all go out and buy loaded guns immediately. That is what the Founding Fathers intended when they gave us the right to bear arms. This is why the stinking government can't take our guns away. Now, there's nothing more spooky than guns, kids. Take it away, Jamie and Mary. Uh, we will take it away. Right to commercial. Yay! Yeah! Yay! We'll be right back. And we are back, as promised. We are fresh off that commercial break. Speaking of, Fresh Off the Boat is going to need to ziplock that freshness in because ABC has just made the second season of the comedy based on Eddie Huang's, sorry, Eddie Huang's memoir a full season. I don't know about you, but we're ready for 22 episodes that were picked up for another season. Mad shout out to ABC for getting uh, more diverse with this one. Uh, Eddie Wong likes hip hop though, so I guess that's like kind of fusion and forward thinking of them, especially since the show takes place in a state with the world's tallest cross. Oh, Florida. Never change. I don't know about you, but I'm feeling like 22 cycles of America's Next Top Model is over. Now I have to give up my dream of becoming America's Next Top Model. In a tragic Tyra Bale, Banks announced this season of America's Next Top Model, the 22nd cycle, will be the last round of smizing. Tyra, we're not ready to say goodbye. The least you can do is give us a spin-off of America's Next Top Best Friend. Without Tyra's coaching, I'll have to rely on Mary's advice on how to be a strong and sensual individual. And that's all right, although at this point, I was getting worried that I'd have to figure out how to deal with boys with beautiful butts on my own. And if Tyra doesn't host America's Next Top Best Friend, I'm nominating myself to do it because, yeah? You know, right? if anyone could host a best friend competition, it's you, Jamie. Stop it. No, you stop. No, you stop. Let's hear some TV reviews from my best friend, Isabel. Thanks, Jamie. You're my best friend, too. The Hulu original show, Casual, follows the lives of a divorcee, her teenage daughter, and her online dating website creator brother. Although the divorcee is a therapist and her brother is depressed, the show still maintains a good comedic rhythm to it. It combines dry wit and dark humor to create this edgy comedy vibe. Think girls, but good. It does get very Dunham-esque when the uncle watches his niece have sex in a hot tub. That's okay though, because most of this family's conversation seems to be about sex. It gets to the point where you can't tell if you're really uncomfortable or really jealous of how pro hookup culture the mom is. Probably both. Either way, congrats on all the sex capades. The CW's new comedy slash musical series, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, is a musical love letter to all of us who have repeatedly stalked a potential significant other's Facebook likes. Don't act like you didn't just click on your crush's profile picture when we started talking about sex capades. Crazy Ex-Girlfriend follows a successful New York lawyer's transition to Southern California in order to rekindle a flame from high school. Is she a little crazy for following a boy she dated for six months across the country? Yes. Is that one of the most relatable things about her? Yes. Although it did evoke a little bit of Smash PTSD when they first broke into song, hopefully it becomes a Smash, unlike Smash. Back to you guys. Thanks, Isabel. Best friend. All I need in this life of sin is for a TV musical to actually be decent. And I hope that happens for you, Jamie. You know what I also hope? What's that? That there's some good TV news. Today's your lucky day! <gasps> for the two of you that don't know, the new Star Wars trailer dropped last night, and if you haven't 
already seen it, I suggest you crawl out from whatever rock you're subletting for, for the school year and watch it. The epic full-length trailer features all sorts of Star Wars stuff. Mentions of the Force, the Millennium Falcon, Stormtroopers, Harrison Ford in a vest. Plus, like that wasn't overwhelming enough, tickets have officially gone on sale for the first showings of the movie. So we suggest that you awaken whatever force is necessary to get yourself to the nearest computer before they're all gone. The movie is set to come out this Christmas, and until then, all we can do is just keep hitting that replay button and praying to God that J.J. Abrams plans to keep his signature lens flares to a minimum. That's all we can do. Jennifer Lawrence is done being adorable, okay? Okay? No, but seriously, Jennifer is sick and tired of being cute, especially when it comes to unequal pay in Hollywood. Just when you thought that J-Law couldn't get more quirky and relatable, it turns out she experiences sexism too. Stars, they're just like us if they're female. In a recent letter, Lawrence wrote for Lenny Letter, she called out sexism in the industry and her anger towards not being paid as much as her male co-stars for her work in American Hustle. Because we all know Bradley Cooper and Jeremy Renner both have held, you know, billion dollar franchises on their shoulders while also winning every entertainment award there is. That's, wait, that's, that's Jennifer. Okay, that, I thought so. Okay, uh, continue with your takedown of Hollywood misogyny, Jen, and we will just continue flocking to the theaters to see literally anything you're in always. Remember back in the day when going to the movies was a special event that required an entire day worth of free time? Quentin Tarantino does, and he wants it back. Most well known for Pulp Fiction and hating modern technology, uh, he announced that he is going to release his upcoming movie, The Hateful Eight, in two different versions. One will be widely released in normal format, and the other will be a limited release. Three hour event shot on .77 film with added scenes and an intermission. And I thought the ninja battle scene in Kill Bill Volume 1 was long. Jeez. No one can say for sure whether either versions of the Hateful Eight will, what they will have in store, but I have a feeling we will be seeing a lot of Tarantino's odd and disconcerting face on the red carpet at this, year, at this year because of them. He's just so lumpy. For anyone out there that forgot Donald Trump is not a good guy, speaking of lumpy, and Emerging Pictures wants to make sure you remember. The movie distributor is re-releasing their 2011 documentary, You've Been Trumped, a beautiful true life account of the time Donald Trump tried to build a golf course on protected conservation land in Scotland and pissed everyone off. <laughs> the VP of Emerging Pictures says he wants to re-release the film to remind everyone that Trump's business skills he's you know, built his entire presidential bid around aren't really that fantastic. Now this sounds like the kind of educational film that could be screened in a, I don't know, a small Massachusetts town's elementary school gymnasium. You know, for educational purposes. So if you finally want to provide your older relatives with proof that Donald Trump is not fit for president, you can request the documentary to be played at the theater near you if you want to watch it. Please watch it. Don't vote for Trump. If the entertainment business was a monopoly board, Netflix would be buying up every space and making you wish you had never agreed to play with them in the first place. First, they decide to answer all our prayers with the Gilmore Girls reboot, and now they just released their first feature film, Beasts of No Nation, and it's already getting award season buzz. The movie tells the story of an army of child soldiers and their leader fighting in West Africa. Both of the lead characters, Idris Elba and breakout star Abraham Atta, are earning praise for their performances and could be seeing nominations in their future. It sounds like the kind of project that the Oscars would love. Ridiculously sad and full of children in peril. Maybe the cast can sit with the casts of Orange is the New Black and House of Cards at this year's Golden Globes and make everyone else wish they were on the, in on the streaming game. It's Netflix's world, people, and we're just paying $7.99 a month to live in it. You know, I did always say if someone could take over the world, it would be Netflix. I agree. I mean, Netflix has the power to take my money and feed my binge-watching addiction. It's powerful stuff, Mary. Hey, Jamie, do you know what today is? Why, no, I don't. What's today? It's Back to the Future Day. Yeah, it is. The future is now. The future is now. And we've never been more basic. Where's my hoverboard? I don't know. But you know what else is right now, actually, uh, is movie reviews. Let's toss it over to you, Joey. What's up, Joey? Thanks, guys. I uh, don't have a hoverboard here, but I do have reviews, so let's get to those. The Intern, starring Robert De Niro, is the story of an elderly man who is bored and gets a job. Now, before you go sprinting off to see Robert De Niro's old man quest to be unbored, let me tell you it's not quite as exciting as Trump's. The movie centers around De Niro working at fashion startup About the Fit, run by Jules, played by Anne Hathaway. 
Anne Hathaway is the most well-meaning she's been in years, easily surpassing her roles of well-meaning prostitute in Les Mis and well-meaning and not in the slightest bit mean supervillain in The Dark Knight Rises. And now it's her turn to play well-meaning Devil Wears Prada boss. But what actually happens in the movie? Well, for one thing, there's a romantic subplot between De Niro and a coworker that has all the romantic tension of a Cialis commercial. Or maybe their courtship is a little too old-fashioned for me. Well, with all the funeral first dates and in-office erotic butt massages, ew. Two-thirds of, of the workaholics round out the cast and completely outact Academy Award winner Robert De Niro. The emotional climax of the film is Hathaway tearfully confessing her broken home life while De Niro lays on a hotel bed and tries not to fall asleep. Half the movie is him grimacing at events until they advance the scene so he can go home. And when the movie mercifully ends on a shot of him failing to pretend to know yoga, the tiny part of your brain that remembers how much you loved The Godfather Part II slowly withers away as you let the Starbucks bathroom stall soundtrack drown out the audience boos and old couple cheers. People, please call your grandparents every once in a while. Otherwise, they might get bored and actually go see this garbage. Well, the results are in. The darts landed on Wolverine and whimsical Brits on the Warner Brothers CEO's dartboard of franchise reboots. And so now here we are with the new movie Pan, starring Hugh Jackman. The movie serves as an origin story for Peter Pan, but as soon as Peter is lifted from his orphanage by a band of Mad Max reject pirates as they battle the Luftwaffe, you know this isn't going to go well. The story is so not Peter Pan that the studio legally got around not donating to the children's hospital that every other Pan film ever did. Instead, every cliche from the franchise starter kit makes a cameo in this one. Pan is the product of a warrior prophecy? Check. Pan and a mysterious stranger named Hook become friends? Check. Pan is trapped in a slave mine where other boys sing Smells Like a Teen Spirit a cappella. Wait, what? For most of the movie, Pan and Hook run around the Neverland wilderness, which looks like Avatar's Pandora, poorly drawn in crayon. And from there, they meet up with Tiger Lily and her, and her tribe of savages in order to defeat Blackbeard. A controversy has been made of the movie casting Caucasian actress Rooney Mara in the traditionally Native American role of Tiger Lily. Trust me, there's more to be upset about in this movie than its racial politics, like how it hates hospitalized children, for one thing. But Tiger Lily and her savages are n so clearly not any ethnic group, it's almost comical. They don't look like a proud, storied culture. They look like a color, a color run that crashed into a Hobby Lobby pipe cleaner aisle. And I don't recall Native Americans poofing into colorful smoke when they died. Here's some advice, movie. If you want us to care about the good guys, don't make their deaths freaking awesome to, to look at. I should not watch a deadly battle scene and think, Man, it'd be more fun to run through that and get macheted than sit here and hear some advice to the audience. Instead of wasting 12 bucks on this shipwreck, maybe slide that cash into a donation box for a children's hospital. It'll do some real good and save you two hours of banging your head in the seat in front of you. Back to you guys. Wow, uh, I'm not sure what's worse. The idea of getting so bored with your elderly life that you want to work an office job or watching children in a slave mine sing It Smells Like Teen Spirit. Well, they both sound equally terrible, Mary. Yeah, we need something good to holla back on after those two terrible movies. Well, I think I know just the thing. <laughs> Gwen Stefani has released her new single, Used to Love You, this Saturday at New York's Hammerstein Ballroom. The new ballad must be an allusion to her divorce from rocker Gavin Rossdale. The couple separated in August, citing irreconcilable differences. For Gwen, it seems like it was a sweet escape. Stefani is about to release her third solo album, though no date has been set. She has confirmed that all the material came fast. Will Smith, whose kids are now more relevant than the Fresh Prince himself, is making a comeback. Smith has just dropped an EDM remix of the song Fiesta by Bamba Estereo. When Will Smith wasn't on set for the Suicide Squad, he spent his free time recording 30 songs for a new album. If there's anything I've learned from watching Will, or from listening to Will Smith's EDM track, it's that he isn't a regular dad. He's a cool dad. Internet trolls prevented a 23-year-old man in North Southampton from listening to Rick Astley's Never Gonna Give You Up. That's right. Jack White, uh, not to be confused with the White Stripes rocker, set forth on the rather ambitious undertaking to help raise money for the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation. 
Uh, White vowed to lock himself in the hotel room for 75 hours of silence. His only company, Rick Astley's 80s classic and a YouTube live stream. The voyage was concluded after just eight hours due to abusive internet trolls who harassed both him and his seven-year-old nephew who suffers from the disease in the comments section. If someone wants to be Rickrolled for diabetes research, let them Rickroll themselves. The dish is calling out internet trolls, back off and don't hurt us. Miley Cyrus has teamed up with Flaming Lips frontman Wayne Coyne. The former child star recently released an album titled Miley Cyrus and Her Dead Pets, featuring the Flaming Lips. The duo will go on tour starting in November. One of their shows will feature a performance by a completely naked Cyrus. It will be filmed as a video for her song Milky Milky Milk. Coyne revealed that by the end of the song, the entire band and crowd will be covered in milk. Where are they going to get all of this milk? Well, what if the fans are lactose intolerant? Most importantly, I just want to know why. What are you trying to achieve here, Milky Cyrus? I don't know. But Oprah Winfrey has called out rapper T.I. for openly criticizing presidential candidate Hillary Clinton earlier this month. T.I. stated that a woman would be too incompetent to be president. Uh, getting word of his remarks, Winfrey lashed out with, Honey child, hush your mouth. Since dropping the comment, T.I. has apologized to the public, but that didn't stop his wife from coming to his support. Who, who is T.I. to decide whether or not an entire gender of humans is competent enough or not to be present? I mean, this is coming from someone whose biggest hit is about being a sugar daddy. If I could have whatever I like, it would be a world without misogyny. Down with the patriarchy. We should probably toss it to music reviews. Thankfully, T.I. is outdated, and I don't expect him to have released anything. Take it away, Daniela. That's right, Mary. No T.I. reviews here. In my quest to find a band that no Emerson student has ever heard of, I found Deer Hunter. If you're anything like me and you like to spend Saturday's nights listening to R.E.M., Thomas Earl Petty, and In Excess, then you're going to love the new Deer Hunter album. Drawing from these quintessential rock artists, Fading Frontier is just like any prior Deer Hunter record. Frontman Bradford, Co uh, Bradford Cox has packed these tracks full of pithy and provocative statements on pop culture. Though not as all strong as Halsey and, Di and Digest, the album is a return to the band's experimental pop core. Songs such as Duplex Plant and Take Care are a great presentation of the fun the band is having once again. No actual deers were harmed in the making of this album. This is the perfect album to make you the top dog of the underground music industry. I'd also like to note that no deer were harmed in the making of this album. Former Disney child star Selena Gomez, who recently opened up about her battles with lupus, has come into her own with her second solo album, Revival. In the title track, Selena sings, It's My Time to Butterfly, and no statement could be more true for the star who has had many positive headlines in the last few weeks. The album is a perfect presentation of her growth and maturity over the past few years. Where most Disney child stars move towards the risque and you know, virtually sexual a la Emily Osment, Let's Be Friends, or Kylie Williams' Spectacular, Gomez is taking a classier approach. Be sure to check out her tracks such as Hands to Myself and Me in the Rhythm, which is about losing yourself to the dance floor. And we must not forget everyone's new favorite top 40 song that will make you feel really sexy. For the lactose intolerant Disney Channel fans who can't listen to Miley's Milky Milk Milk, this is the perfect album for you. That's all I have for you this week. Time for me to lose myself in the dance floor. Back to you, Jamie and Mary. Thanks, Daniela. I think I'm about ready to lose myself on the dance floor. Jamie, would you care to join me? I would like nothing more. Thank you for tuning into this episode of The Dish, and happy Back to the Future Day. Great Scott, the future is now, and we couldn't be more basic. Tune in next week to see if I'm the host of America's Next Top Best Friend. And to see if I'm still lost on the dance she floor. She probably will be. See you next time.